Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks very much for coming. Uh, and thanks for finding us. It's a little bit awkward up here. Apologies for the room, which is a little bit narrow and long. But hopefully you can hear us OK. There's not too many of us here. We may be joined by a few more colleagues um, during the course of this session. So my name is Ben Godden. I'm a director with Vision Asset Management. We're based out of London. And it's my pleasure this afternoon, really, to introduce and to chair the panel session that we have here today. Um, and as you know, this is all about recycling, upcycling, and conversions. So the title is a little bit awkward, a little bit clunky, but we're going to focus on some key areas with my panelists, really based around the whole world of hotel renovation and the use of space. Um, in terms of the way we want to run this, we're going to open up some questions from myself to the panelists. And towards the end of the session, we're going to take questions from yourselves as well. So we want that participation. And I guess we're going to be here about an hour uh, altogether. Um, probably right that we introduce our panelists, our learned panelists uh, this afternoon who are here. So perhaps, Dexter, would you like to start by introducing yourself, your company, and what you do? And then we can work along, perhaps, towards Matt and Jacob. Thank you. Thanks, Ben. Can uh, everyone hear? Is that working? Yeah? OK, good. I don't know if these uh, work. Um, I'm an architect. I uh, run a company called Dexter Moran Associates. We actually are an architectural and interiors practice. We are about 50 people. We're based in London. And uh, we work across the entire spectrum of uh, the hospitality industry, um, even with regard to stadiums as well as hotels. And uh, our biggest market is obviously our home turf in London, but we're working quite a lot in other parts of the world. In Europe, we have a network with other practices, and in Africa. Our model is just to have our single office, and we form relationships with practices in other parts of the world, wherever we may work. And that's, that's how we execute our projects. Thank you. Thank you, Dexter. Matt? Welcome. Hi guys, Matt, uh, Jumeirah Group. I, um, I actually look after our new contemporary lifestyle. Hi, Alison. Um, I look after the new brand we rolled out, uh, or late 2014, contemporary lifestyle brand under Jumeirah Group. Um, I look after the, the brand development as well as the operation. Currently, we have several under construction, <clears throat> one in Germany, Saudi, and Dubai, and several negotiations underway. Um, I look forward to this conversation today. Thank you, Matt. Jacob, welcome. Hi, I'm Jacob. I work for Pandox. We are a um, hotel property investor based in Stockholm. Currently own 121 hotels, um, 19 of uh, which we operate ourselves. Uh, the remaining part of the portfolio, we um, use variable lease structures uh, with, um, I think we're up at around 19 brands. Uh, we were listed as of June on the uh, Stockholm Stock Exchange. And, uh, yeah, that's, that's very good. Us. Thank you. Okay, so our session this afternoon, recycling, upcycling, and conversions. It's all about the use of space, really, in hotels, maximizing value from the use of space. In what we do with Envision, it's looking at life from an investor, from an ownership perspective. Um, and it's a broad subject, but we're going to focus on some key, we're going to funnel it into some key areas. Specifically this afternoon, I'm interested in hearing the panel's view, really, of what's happening in the market, what is the consumer looking for? Is it brand that is leading or is it consumer that's leading? What's happening in the use of space for food and beverage to maximize return? Other space, not just hotel bedroom space, in terms of uh, maximizing return. With what frequency, perhaps from an investment side, you'd expect a change to take place within a design concept, within a food and beverage, um, outlet concept, the cost of all of that, and what are the trends in terms of FF&E reserves, etc. Okay, so perhaps we start right at the top, gentlemen, and maybe my first question, Matt, is going to come to you. What is today's consumer looking for? What's the millennial consumer looking for in today's hotels? I think what we're seeing um, 
And it's kind of fresh on my mind because we had to do a lot of research uh, when we were working on this new brand I mentioned, contemporary lifestyle brand venue under the Jumeirah Group. Um, what we're seeing is uh, they're looking for flexibility. They're looking for choices. Um, they're, they're, they're all about being able to participate in what you're doing. Uh, and, 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 and frankly, we were lucky enough because uh, the group owns uh, Academy Hospitality School in Dubai. Uh, we got some of those students, millennials, participate in uh, coming out with this brand. Um, so flexibility, being able to participate. They love to travel. Uh, curiosity is that they stay current via those traveling experiences. Um, technology and speed of that, te 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 that technology plays a big role in it. Um, we also saw um, it's ever changing. It's 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 constantly. While we were doing it, we realized it changed again. Um, I, I recently uh, read an article. Uh, more than 50% of this Gen Y, uh, they're saying marriage even needs to be. Uh, you should have an opt out at, at the end of the second year. So they're they're not necessarily. Uh, they're making that kind of decision for. Uh, a huge marriage concept, let alone where they stay. Uh, so with that, uh, so we felt uh, millennials are all about uh, uh, those, those choices, uh, flexibility, uh, speed, and technology. I'm interested in the fact that you say it's constantly changing. Mm -hmm. And therefore, I guess, Jacob, question to you, are, is the consumer, are, are the brands, running to catch up with the trends that the consumer dictates. Are, you, are the brands behind the curve? Uh, well, and, and if so, how far behind? Uh, I would say yes and no. Uh, why I say no is that um, what they want and, and um, what they like, I think we can find a, a wide scale of hotel concepts. We have, I think, more brands than ever now. Um, ranging from hostel brands to luxury brands, so the, the, the supply is there for different type of, of interest. However, what I think is, is lacking in the, in the hotel industry is the, I guess more of a con consumer behavior. So, and by that I mean the solutions of actually staying at a hotel. Whereas, if we can generalize millennials um, as one group, um, they're a product of um, a society. Uh, they're a product of that society during that type of age or, or something like that. So they are take technology for granted. Um, there are some social issues that they take for granted. But if we look at the technology access, they take it for granted that they will be able to check in on their smartphone. They will take it for granted that that is a, a time-saving issue that you can easily find uh, on your cell phone. Um, or your smartphone. So, in terms of, of the look and the feel and, and the, um, uh, the form, the, the, the concepts and the brands, I think it's, um, it's pretty much up there. Okay. But in, in, the, in the solutions of actually how to stay in a hotel, I think they're lacking. <coughs> yeah. Thank you. Dexter, from a design perspective, um, and you work for individual clients, you work for brands, I'm sure. And, and understanding the, the ever-changing consumer behavior, how, how do you approach that? How do you ensure that what you're designing, the space you're redeveloping, is going to be current? Well, I think um, we obviously work uh, and have worked for nearly 25 years in this industry, and we need to keep ahead of the trends. I mean, I think the, the thing that hotels um, have moved away from is that concept of the universal solution to every city, every country. And people are coming back to the individuality and the particularity of every location. And, and that's great for designers because it means that you can be ultimately creative. And so what we're doing is we're trying to drill into what the particularity of that place is and then make designs that, that, that respond to that. And that's through to new builds. I mean, we've just delivered a new Hilton in London and Bankside near Hilton, which is, you know, people have walked in there and said, this is not a Hilton, but the point is it is a Hilton. And Hilton loves that. 
it must have been intercon. Slow down. Intercon, we're, we're, we're listening in. Um, uh, and, and people like that because it's actually just that experience. I, I, I was at the Africa Hotel Conference and listened to the CEO of, of Accor. Uh, uh, last year say that he doesn't no longer wants um, any of his guests to wake up in a room and not know where they are. Um, five years ago he said exactly the opposite. So it's very interesting and the hotels are moving in that sort of sea change. So so I think that's quite critical. Uh, on on the issues of F and B, it really depends on where you are. Uh, in Dubai, people go to hotels to eat. Mm -hmm. In London, unless you've got a signature chef, people don't gravitate to a hotel to eat. So you've got to make the restaurant something completely independent and, and operate as its own entity. Um, mm -hmm. One of the projects we did uh, some years ago was the Ampersand in South Ken. It has an independent restaurant. It happens to offer breakfast to the guest, mm. but it's seen as its own identity, has its own entrance, and that's the model. That, that goes through London, even the the Hampton, uh, Hilton and Waterloo, there isn't a restaurant. Um, that was an interesting negotiation with Hilton, but there is a Portuguese steakhouse uh, branded, which happens to open some doors and serve breakfast. But the rest of the day, you, whereas you would have an empty restaurant if it was a Hilton, it's actually quite an active restaurant. So, But in Dubai, it would be completely different. So each location, again, comes back to that concept of particularities of design, particularities of what you deliver. All of those things are important. So I'm interested in the fact that you're saying um, hotel space is changing, food and beverage is changing. Um, I guess, Jacob, question for you really from, a, from a, a brand perspective, because you own and operate, Pandox owns and operates under a number of different brands, right? Yes, correct. Okay. Is there any particular brand you feel is, is using space particularly attractively or differently now within your portfolio, or is it much of a muchness? Are, are the big brands a little bit slow, a little bit clunky when it comes to change of use for space or developing creative space? Um, again, again, I would say yes and no too. Um, we have um, some some brands that actually try to, for instance, food and beverage, um, try to make a standalone food and beverage concepts that should work without the hotel. Um, the space, uh, depending on the brand standards, I don't know if they can, as we did in our hostel, take in a tattoo shop in the in the lobby, using right. the the, uh, the lobby as retail space. So some are tied down for obvious reasons um, because of brand standards. Um, in space, I would also add in that if we going back to the the, the previous question about the the consumer versus brand and the, and the curb, I would say that many of the service functions, many of the service positions um, are still stuck in a very old-fashioned thinking. Um, whereas I do think that the, the, the modern guest today would appreciate a yoga instructor instead of a doorman because the, the, the car he'll get from Uber. So, um, in terms of space, the smaller, uh, the more flexible ones, we can, we can often find more um, efficient solutions. Okay, okay. Dexter, when you talk about um, people stepping into a hotel and they just don't expect that from that particular brand, who's driven that? Is that the owner of the hotel who's driven that perspective or is it the brand itself or is it a combination of both? I think it's a combination of both. But I think stepping into hotels has changed radically. I mean, probably Citizen M should take the credit for changing the lobby. Um, because there was, for many years, that kind of uh, dead space where people sort of were waiting for to be picked up or whatever the case may be. And the, the whole concept of the interactive lobby is it's gone through the brands. I mean, Intercon have introduced their active lobby, for example, on Holiday Inns. And I mean, my office is opposite a particular Holiday Inn that we designed, for example, 12 years ago. And two years ago, we changed the lobby. We ripped it all out. And we took, you know, that business center, which was that sort of thing behind, in, in behind a glass window that, you know, with a printer and stuff and the concierge. It's all part of the same active lobby space. Space. And I know because I walk past that hotel every day that it was dead. Now it's full of life. People are going there, they're having meetings. It's, it's coffee shop meets hotel meets act action. And in the evening, the bar serves drinks. But it is all one active space. And so the kind of 
comfortable space that you're in, that you want to sit in, that isn't feel like you're transient, is the kind of thing that, that, that hotels are making. And, and it must also help the bottom line, because they're actually able to, to, to have some re revenue generation. Mm. And nobody actually wants to go in a blast box to do some work. It's like in a cafe. You sit there with your laptop. You need a printer that's close by. You know, mm. That's fine. You want to sit up. You want to sit down. Different kind of seating. Mm. And, and, and that's kind of changed changed the perception of, of what makes makes hotels. And also, I, uh, my colleague referred to the concept of retail. I mean, we've developed a, a new scheme with, with Indigo, IHG, where in actual fact, the, the, the food and beverage offer, not only is it ha a separate identity, but it actually, uh, it, it not only responds to neighborhood, but it brings the neighborhood back in. So you think of it, you're, you're baking bread in the morning. Why not invite that the guest in? So, you know, it, it's become a deli. Okay. Yeah, and, and that that's a, a very exciting thing. You know, okay. So those, those use class orders, you know, this is hotel, this is hostel, this, they're all merging. Retail's coming in. It, it's actually very exciting. And we're going to explore that um, a little bit later in, in the discussion. Um, Matt, in terms of uh, th from the investment side, from the ownership side, people need space to generate income. Mm -hmm. And traditionally, elements of food and beverage within hotels were perhaps producing a marginal income, maybe break even, maybe at a loss. From, from your perspective and within your brand, how much of a focus do you have on that income piece when you decide use of space in food and beverage, for instance? Well, when we looked at the use of space, really we started from outside of the building. You know, when you pull up in a car, you know, the first thing you notice is the facade and we felt the energy needed to start outside of the building and as you walk in, the basics of lifestyle brand has to be there, the scent, lighting, music, you know, all of the above. And as you walk in this through the space, it's no longer this, this uh, traditional front desk and, and, and several talent behind that desk and you would just go, it's all about passport, credit card, and it's a bit of a transactional, none of that is, you know, let it be Indigo, let it be Citizen M, let it be us. So everybody's doing that. That's just because it's gone away. Um, so the, the, what they're looking for is uh, provocation of their, their senses. Um, and that is the scent, the music, the lighting, but also interaction with the talent. So when we, when we talk about that space, within an eyesight, there might be a coffee shop. Um, that coffee shop becomes the bar at night. Um, it's no longer a gift shop in a traditional sense, you get your basic needs, but it's more of a pop-up retail store. It doesn't necessarily require a large space, but you're able to just get what you need. Plus, some of the things that you wouldn't necessarily know about and having that local access available at your fingertip. Or having that talent interaction within that space, it's no longer a concierge desk and a, a welcome desk or, or, or any other services that you might have at a typical hotel. You might have a, a, a little uh, 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 ladies and gentlemen uh, just kind of with an iPad just giving you access to things that you wouldn't have if you weren't staying at this location. So how do you maximize uh, the, the investment yeah. Yeah. is really through this retail pop-up stores. Having the right food and beverage, regardless of what mood you're in, you're able to satisfy your needs with the similar type of interest people within that space. But most importantly, out of all, like design is critical because as you walk through this space, you want to look around and just say, yeah, I have that in my living room. Or you aspire to have that. Wouldn't that be nice if I had that in my living room? So just because we are provoking your interest, right? We're aspiring to have that kind of a lifestyle. But also type of people that you, want, you have around you. But most importantly, the interaction you have with the talent that works there. That's what makes it work. Okay. That's what makes, it, makes you want to do it again. Um, it's almost like similar to Jimmy Fallon's show, those that you watch that show. Really, if you think about it, what happens at that show is all depending on who the guest is. Guest comes, depending, their ba uh, ba depending on their background, they might be singing, they're playing games. So that interaction makes the experience that makes you watch it and then also makes others want to do it again. So combination of all of those three things that we mentioned okay. is really what makes it a, a, a true good investment. Okay. So I can see how that happens in a lifestyle brand. 
yeah. where you have that element of uh, informality, quirkiness. I guess, Jacob, question for you is how do you translate all of that into perhaps a traditional urban hotel where you've got, I guess, a traditional box which serves a purpose. It's the traveling businessman, perhaps not quite the millennial traveler. Uh, you know, how do you get maximum use of space? How do you refresh that space intelligently to get a better return, you know, than was being used for before? Um, or is it possible? Or is it just not possible? Well, uh, it, it, is a, it is an interesting question, but, but first and foremost, we, we need to know our guests. However, this type of, of uh, interaction we just mm. mentioned mm. is not only for lifestyle hotels, I think. It is, it is a, a, a growing trend uh, that will increase the, 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 way of tra uh, the way we travel. I don't think it's just this very cheek boutique mm. hotel that uses this. I think it's a, a human thing almost. Okay. That we want, yeah, we want interaction in a more um, real way. Okay. So, so and um, hence, I guess, the, the, the staffing must know this. But, of course, if we have a, a hotel in a mining city uh, up in the northern Sweden, maybe this is not the, the case of using that. But, and then a, tr a more traditional um, restaurant conference space is, is more appropriate there. Okay. So, uh, well, let's face it, it's not a, a lifestyle brand expectation, huh? This is a, if you want to be relevant within the next five to ten years, you got to speak to their language, you got to give them what they're looking for. And so it, it could be a traditional hotel brand or luxury brand as Jumeirah, unless we, we provide these type of services and design speaks to their language, we're not going to be relevant anymore. Okay. So it's, it's, it's kind of like a must do regardless of what brand you are. So in terms of hotel types, Let's go from one end of the scale to the other end of the scale in terms of space and utilization. Let's talk maybe, Dexter, for a couple of moments about resort hotels, where traditionally you've got enormous amount of perhaps space. You need a broad range of facilities. How do you contemplate in this day and age uh, maximizing or, or redeveloping, recycling that space? Not just in food and beverage, but on the wellness side, for instance. Well, I think. I mean, resort hotels obviously have more of a captive audience than your city hotels, so um, th that's good and bad. Um, but you've got to give those uh, residents, because they're, they're going to be more akin to using the facilities in that hotel, a variety of options and choices of things to do. And then on the wellness side, I mean, that's, that's massive. You know, I mean, I think wellness is the new luxury. Uh, and, you know, from bicycles to whatever sports equipment or, you know, there, there are deals done between some of the sports suppliers and hotels to enable people to not necessarily carry all the stuff with them and they arrive and that sort of provision is, is really critical. And, uh, you know, uh, depending on where, I was, I was recently at, an, at an Intercon in, in, in Davos and, and there they've got a, a, a quite an advanced children's area, you know, for different ages. I mean, I have some young kids, so there was nursery level, but then there was a teenage area, and that was sort of linked to where there was a cinema. And so there's a lot of thought that goes into all of that to provide the kind of facilities that people want when they're in a resort, when they're not necessarily going outside of the hotel. Mm. Um, and, and that's quite different to an urban consideration. The thought c that comes to my mind is, of course, hoteliers put facilities in at some stage to tick a box give you an example, a fitness room was required in perhaps city hotel because uh, the conference buyer may have required some sort of facility uh, in that location, otherwise they wouldn't bring their business to it. Jacob, do you, do you see those facilities having a place in the future or will they potentially disappear? Is a poor excuse for a gym uh, i.e. a poor fitness room going to last or is it just going to be space which is consumed by a Starbucks coffee shop or in uh, time? I think maybe fitness room will, will disappear yeah. and fitness center will enter the hotels whereas uh, a greater uh, amount of value is, is placed on actually being able to 
to have a good uh, fitness center and not just one treadmill and one bike. Um, going back to, to the, the different type of, of uh, uh, hotel rooms, uh, hotels, it's, it's interesting to see that in the budget segment, there's been a lot of development which has actually spread upwards instead of the other way around that the luxury hotels are spreading downwards. Um, so we're seeing a, a bit of a shift in, in where the ideas come from. Mm. Um, but if I check into a mid-scale hotel, where's the value for me to check in without getting the hospitality? If I can check in on my phone and uh, the front desk agent is not just doing the technical aspect of actually checking you in, but being able to help you when you require service. So you can choose when you want service. Um, yeah. Okay. I want to move on a little bit towards the discussion point of frequency and cost of renovation. Um, typically in hotels, we, there would have been a historic view that every seven, eight, nine years, a bedroom required a, so a soft renovation, every 15 years, perhaps a hard renovation. And maybe there was some sort of pattern in food and beverage as well. If I look at the high street restaurateur sec sector, these guys are so smart, they'll put a concept into place. If it's not working within 24, 30 months, they'll take, take it out and start again. So how do we as hoteliers or investors look towards the cycle of renovation into the future? Do we need to be shortening those times? Um, is, is seven years just too long for a bedroom? Um, how, how do we approach that? Dexter, what, what's your view on that? Well, I'm, I'm embarrassed you're giving me that question. I think the uh, operator... You probably want it every year. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'd like it done, yeah. As you say, every six months, start again. Um, it really depends on, on location, depends on the client, and depends on how tired the product is. Um, we would like to think as designers, we try to think a little bit ahead of the box, so you know, it gives it a little bit of longevity. But, um, you know, a major re refurb is, you know, 10, 12 years, I would have thought. I don't know, would you agree? And, depending uh, on a brand, yeah. depending on, yeah, sure. yeah. I mean, and it depends w what's there. I mean, I'm constantly astonished at how many hotels I go into and there's absolutely no plugs beside the bed. Um, and actually, there's new ones that they do like that, some of the budget change. And, and, and I mean, I think, I, I don't think I'm absurdly different to anyone else. We've all got a mobile phone and we tend to use it perhaps as our alarm or motivation mm -hmm. and you want to plug it in beside your bed, not somewhere else. And so those kind of things, those basics, um, I suppose could be minor re refit that you know hotel groups could take on board, mm. but um, you know, uh, uh, and then of course there's there's wear and tear and stuff yeah. like that. So th yeah. that's going on all the time. Jacob, within your brand, your organisation, is there a particular cycle, or how do you know when a product is is ready uh, for an investment? As, as I stated in the beginning, the, the majority of our hotels are under leased um, uh, operations, so. Um, we, we have four or five independent brands, and then we do franchise with, with major brands. Um, it all depends on, depending on, on the, um, we have from hostel to, to uh, five-star hotels. Uh, depending on the market, depending on the, 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 the guest needs and the guest wants. Um, if we want to make an investment, we normally do it with, with uh, um, a joint investment with the operator. Uh, so we share the risk um, where we see, okay, w we need to do something with this hotel. Uh, the time cycle is, is um, it varies a lot, so I, I can't say an exact number. Um, also, okay. the competition. Yeah, yeah. H how did the competition look? So what would be, what, what is, um, to do a soft renovation, can a soft renovation be done in a, a mid-scale hotel for 5,000 euros? As you, as you yeah, say. yeah. Yeah. You can do anything. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, really. And the reason why I'm asking is because from an investment side, often enough costs are led perhaps by the brand, in part in conjunction with compliance towards brand standards. And finding the level of investment under a HMA, clearly that is usually funded by the owner. <clears throat> and it comes perhaps from an FF&E reserve. 
And one of the challenges that I want to explore a little bit is cost of renovation associated with perhaps the amount that is being reserved in that fund, uh, typically. So if on one side we're saying a bedroom can be refreshed for a few thousand, mm -hmm. um, where do you see the trends in, in FF&E going? Perhaps, Matt, question towards you. Um, From a percentage point of view? Yeah. Uh, well, the, the, the percentage we use is around 3%. Uh, that's the number that we use for both the Jumeirah as well as the Veni brand. Um, we don't have one open yet, but when we do open it, okay. that's, that's the idea around it. Um, but, you know, I'm going to go back to millennials, and, and not just millennials, even millennial mindset of people as well. Um, they're all about ever-changing, and they're all about the new thing, and they're about the next thing. So uh, I'm not suggesting that we should be necessarily renovating these things every year, but we got to keep that in mind and, and, and a possible quarterly refresh similar to retail. You know, if you go to a, a particular brand, um, uh, depending on time of the year, that the same shop does look different. And they're not necessarily spending millions of dollars. They're just giving a bit of a facelift to, 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 uh, to enhance it uh, and, and then keep it fresh for those uh, customers of theirs. Uh, and some brands in my uh, previous life have done that, quarterly refresh in the public areas, and in general manager would have a discretionary fund to be able to do that uh, without getting all kinds of approvals to wait for that big FFNE. So frequency needs to be really based on consumer feedback. And nowadays, you have that feedback immediately. Uh, and, and if it becomes overwhelmingly uh, clear that you have to do something about your product, to be competitive in the, the, the landscape that you're in, you got to do it. And if it means more frequent than you originally planned, you have to. Uh, we, we also have plans in place with the Jumeirah Group. Every five years, we assess all of our own assets to ensure that we're up to par uh, and, and, and we're proactively taking care of our assets. So that, that's the kind of simple uh, theory that we play with. And if, if, if we look at, look at um, like the millennial mindsets and, and take away age, so I guess early adopters, they may not be the most loyal guests in a five-year um, term. However, if we're going back to the, the um, discussion about space, in order to have something constantly moving, a uh, hotel can look at the, the lobby and use short-term pop-up stores whereas the, the tenant constantly changes, so the lobby constantly changes. Mm -hmm. So there is a different vibe every six month. Um, uh, you know, startup uh, fashion brands, um, startup uh, um, industries that, that could use this, this retail and have a, a evolving lobby. And um, the risk for a owner uh, is, is limited with, mm -hmm. Because that space is, is um, if not rented out, is lobby space. And okay. same thing with F&B. You can do that same, yeah. same concept. You can change your menu. Uh, so without just going nuts about changing the entire design of your restaurant. And frankly, um, w with the Jumeirah Group, we, we, we have a separate division, Jumeirah Restaurant Group. Um, and a big part of the, the decision, we, we separated them. So they are more agile. They are more quick to be able to change those concepts and menus versus a typical hotel. You tend to be a little slower uh, doing that. Um, so that could be a, another way of uh, giving a bit of a facelift and enhance the product without going crazy It's interesting with the you say that. Uh, yeah. I Dexter? Say the same thing. I mean, we've all got used to pop up restaurants and pop up stuff. And so there's, the, there's that concept, you know, that restaurant could be an entirely different offer from month to month, new, new, new theme. But how do you square that within the brand requirements? Or do you not need to? Is that what we're saying? Is the consumer now so flexible that the traditional hotel restaurant doesn't need to exist per se anymore? I think that brands are incredibly flexible. OK. To, to particularity. I mean, I drew the example of the, the Hampton Hilton. If you spoke to, if you look in the brand centers, they would never say you can't have a restaurant. But we don't. We, in, the one in Waterloo, which is the biggest one in the UK at the moment in time, doesn't actually have a restaurant. It has a facility which will deliver breakfast, which is the main meal that you need to provide for in a hotel like that, in a city like that. But it has a completely different identity. And after breakfast, doors are closed, and you wouldn't know that the two are the same.
And just in terms of cost of that as an indication, because we talk about the bedroom renovation cost per key, do you, Dexter, approach it with a cost, cost per square meter basis for food and beverage space or lobby space in we terms usually, of renovation? We approach it at a certain level and then get cut by half and then... By the, yeah. <laughs> Some of my colleagues who are on the cost side are in the room, you see. Yeah. <laughs> then I get lose an arm and we make it work. <laughs> okay. So 3%, Matt, just coming back to your reserve that you say is typically 3%, seems pretty light to me in terms of if we are to undertake or contemplate uh -huh. a more frequent uh, cycle of change within our hotels. I thought you were probably going to say 5%, minimum 4 I mean, four. that's where you start, um, right. and you end up at 3, similar to what he just said. And yeah. ideally, yes, those are the numbers that you start with, but uh, as you negotiate on average, that's what we're seeing at the moment. Mm. You know, the owner's appetite is not always at 5, 6%. Well, and, and I guess that's sort of a further thought, maybe Jacob, towards you. Um, it depends who holds the purse strings, doesn't it, really? And, and in your case, Jacob, you guys will be holding the purse strings, so every penny or dollar that, that is spent is, needs to represent real value. Yes, it says we, we don't do hotel management contracts. Right. Um, in our franchise operations, yes, we, we hold that for FNE. In the lease um, model, we, we share it with the operator. So yeah. we have our responsibilities in the hotel, and they have their responsibilities in the hotel. And when we're, when we're doing a, um, when we want to do something with the hotel, we do it together with them. So okay. And how do you make that risk. dollar go further? How do you really stretch that budget then? In renovation? Yeah. Will you reuse, for instance, FF&E? Yes, definitely. Since we have the scale, we've done it many times. We have taken um, furnitures from uh, a mid-scale hotel, uh, vintage furnitures, uh, to our hostel, and they loved it. The guests loved it there. Uh, in our mid-scale hotel, it was a bit old-fashioned. Mm -hmm. um, um, so yeah, you so know, the, the FF&E, we can definitely move around our portfolio. Okay. We can also manage that through uh, listening to the co consumer, right? You, you, you don't, if you say, I'm going to do room renovation, you don't have to necessarily replace everything just because room renovation calls for, uh, you know, gut it out. What, what does the customer tell? I mean, what, what are they doing in that room? Uh, you know, what are they not liking? And only replace that. So that would also help your overall number, that dollar, go further. Right. And, and when reno renovating it, um, it is extremely important to know the guests and the people that work uh, on the hotel source movements. Uh, if you know where they put the luggage, if they know where you, where you put your um, housekeeping cart, yeah. which uh, corners they bump into, etc. So it's, it's not just materials and money, it's, it's actually knowing, okay, yep. where are the, the critical areas in this, where, where is the wear and tear. So, yeah. I mean, a certain percentage don't even unpack. Mm. So the good old-fashioned closet space with 10 hangers each and, you know, all of that, you just, now they're just looking for a space to throw the luggage and just get it out of luggage and get out. Okay. Uh, certain percentage, I'm not suggesting that everybody mm. in this room are doing that, uh, but the, the, the millennials are, are not necessarily into closet space as mm. much as maybe you and I were. Mm. Yeah. So just talking about space then, Dexter, question for you. Have you come across a situation where a hotel has just got too much space and understanding <coughs> space new needs to create a return? Have you ever been in a situation where you've had to say to one of your clients, we genuinely have not got a use that we could recommend to you for this space? I've always got a use to recommend to a space, <laughs> make no mistake. But, the, you know, from time to time you will advise. I've got a client at the moment in London that is trying to do a, a four-star hotel in a, in a trendy part of town. They're foreign uh, investors and they're telling me they want a 28 square meter room and I'm telling them that they're off their head because London is a different kind of market and in fact room space in London, I mean we've just delivered the, 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 the New Hilton, it's a 30 square meter room. The Conrad in London is a 28 square meter room. 
and so you know you've got to understand your market you know you would in Dubai we know it's bigger in Africa it's bigger you know but my view on brand standards is your brand standards less 20% if you're in London because the real estate value is such and people's expectation is is, is you know a well designed room can actually work very well I mean many years ago we did the uh, renovation which ended up becoming the Marriott on Cromwell Road now that was a, an old hotel we were stuck with concrete walls and we had to create rooms and the funny thing is the back wing of the of the building was turned into a premier inn because the whole thing was at that stage Whitbread owned the Marriott franchise as you remember so actually there was a moment in time where the, the Marriott room and the premier inn room were exactly the same size and in order to make it work, what we had to do in those days is, is persuade Marriott not to put their big armoire that used to be the focal point in the room mm -hmm. to make it work because it was basically a 22 square meter room. But hey ho, the hotel's still there. It's operating as a Marriott. It's a five star. And if the room is well designed, to be honest with you, people don't actually say, no, this is too small. I've had a similar experience on the other side where I've been into a, a, a hotel, stayed in a hotel in Abuja, and honestly, I felt like it was an echo in the room because the, the furniture doesn't fill the room. You know, it was this vast space, which is more comfortable. I, for me, more comfortable is a, is a cozy space than this sort of vast thing. And again, if you look at lobbies, I've got an interesting comparison. I don't know if any of you have been to Istanbul lately, but there's two new hotels in Istanbul that I just compare. The one is the Raffles Hotel, which is a little bit out of town, and then there's the Soho House, which is dead center of town. The, the Raffles Hotel, you walk into a lobby, it feels like you're in um, an airport. It's gigantic, massive space. And into, in, the, in, in, the, in the Soho House, it's a series of more intimate spaces. Where would you be? I'd rather be in the intimate space. I feel more comfortable. I feel more. I don't want to sit in an airport lounge, you know. So I think hotels are thinking about that. Hey, how do we make those kind of spaces that actually people want to be in, you know? Although I, I expect that there are some people that like to be in those, you know, vast soulless places. But I think, that, by and large, not the sort of future. Taking the word recycling and just stretching that to one extreme, obviously the recycling of old buildings from an original use <coughs> to a hotel use is something we've seen happen quite extensively in city centre downtown locations especially. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And in many respects perhaps the use of space from my perspective as we see it in those old buildings that are recycled to become good hotels is a very attractive use of space from the guest perspective and also from the ownership perspective. Have you got, I mean Matt, have you got some thoughts on, on sure. how buildings are used uh, for a different purpose than they were originally intended? We've got one right now in St. Petersburg, a Jumeirah group. Um, we're converting this beautiful historical building into a, a phenomenal Jumeirah hotel which will open uh, hopefully sometime end of next year. Uh, but uh, from a personal experience, Actually, they're in the room, uh, just the Getty group. Um, uh, I was running this hotel in Chicago. I won't uh, mention the name of the property. Um, it, this was a, a phenomenal uh, a building on Michigan Avenue, converted into uh, what it is today. Um, and, and, and it was a challenging because the task because you had to protect what was in there and then still make it relevant to current customer. Um, they did a phenomenal job doing that. Hotel had uh, a history with Al Capone, um, where he used to get his hair cut at this hotel, and that, that particular space was kept as a meeting space, and where he would hide his alcohol was also kept within that space. Excellent. And, and the ballroom, uh, uh, the, the movie Untouchable was filmed in this ballroom, and, and back in the day in Chicago, who's, who's of Chicago had their weddings there? Um, and, and keeping that, that original essence of the building, articulating it into a, 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 and making it relevant to a, a, a current customer, but also getting the talent in the building, knowing all of that, and delivering against that brand promise is really the key. And a quick example, uh, director of sales and marketing of that hotel was from Chicago, and his grandmother actually had her wedding at this hotel in that ballroom. Um, and, and, you know, it, it still gives me goosebumps mm. that the, the way he would tell mm. this story. And, and um, 
So we ended up having him doing the orientation for the property because he was able to articulate what that building stood for in Chicago mm. and how that personal story came to life. <clears throat> and then the, the current brand articulation and then the great F&B, we had this Spanish uh, uh, tapas restaurant, it was a talk of a town, and, and, and it was only 225 rooms, so it was just cozy enough. It's the ideal hotel in this downtown location. So if you get that recipe correctly, yeah. it, it, it's, 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 a, uh, it's a wonderful success, without mm -hmm. a doubt. Mm -hmm. is, that, is that the pool room where Robert De Niro speaks about baseball? Yes, no, exactly, that. that's the scene. Yeah. That's the scene. That is, see? Yeah. So Jacob knows it. Absolutely. Yeah. So you walk up for the plug, Getty Group. <laughs> yeah. I'd also Thanks, say that, I mean, you know, in, 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 in many cities, you've got very fine buildings that weren't originally, uh, all their uses are, 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 are no longer uh, um, valid. So, for example, we recently got planning for uh, Tower Bridge Magistrates Court as, as a hotel. And the, the interesting thing is, if you look at those buildings, there's a building for sale, uh, uh, and it has some interesting historic spaces. What use are you going to put to those buildings? And uh, the hotel is a great use because, one, it gives permanent access to what are considered heritage spaces. And generally speaking, planners like the idea that the, in posterity people can go into there rather than they convert it into something else. And so you've got a win-win situation because it wouldn't be much use some of that heritage space as an office space, except one lobby maybe, um, maybe some uh, executive's uh, fancy office. But it, it doesn't really work for housing. Mm. Um, and so the hotel is a, is a great enhancement. And then the secret is, of course, how many keys in my world you can carve out of the rest of the site or the, the areas yeah. that are of less historic importance. Yeah. And, and that's where you know, the added value of, of, of a good space planner is. Yeah, and helps regenerate perhaps inner city areas that are uh, perhaps in need of investment and, and, but, and uh, districts that need to be uplifted. You, you, you can get a great opportunity of opening up, and, and the same, I was talking about the, 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 um, the Soho House in Istanbul, which was the American Embassy, the yeah. old one. And yeah. again, it's great because they've actually been able to open those rooms, put a little bit of contemporary stuff into it, but you've got that posterity retained. Very good. Thank you, gentlemen. I'm conscious of time, actually. I think we should probably, uh, it's, it's 10 to 1 now. We do have a microphone if there are some questions, perhaps, from around the floor. Um, are there any questions, folks, to, uh, towards any of our panelists at all? Yes, please. Do we have a microphone for the lady, please? I can shout. There's not many people. I've got a loud voice. Um, I was going to ask Dexter, because obviously you had a you've got a really broad view of properties and you've seen lots of different hotels all over the world. Is there anything for you that's really stood out that you've walked in and said, wow, I wish I'd done that? <laughs> that's a very good question. Um, but I'm, always, I'm always impressed by, by, by things at various levels. I mean, you know, um, I, I was talking about recently staying at the, da the Davos Intercon and I, I, I thought it was a beautiful building. It wasn't designed by me. The outside is very iconic. It has a sort of egg-shaped uh, gold building. Um, also, there's some great uh, grand hotels. I, 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 my father was in, in, in movie making, advertising, so I used to go to Cannes as a, as a young boy. And the Carlton Hotel has always had a special memory for me. And that is a fantastic grand space. I mean, that's sort of exceptional of, of, a, of a beautiful grand space, but actually not massively underutilized space. It's actually quite efficient, and it's, it's, a, it's a great space. One of the things that I think, though, is, is lost, that we've lost in, in hotels, is that, that experience of the grand staircase. Um, it, nobody's building grand staircases anymore, and there's something very special about a grand staircase. And we, we renovated a hotel uh, in London a, a couple of years ago, which I mentioned earlier, also the ampersand, and it happened to have a really nice staircase, which happens to come through into the lobby, and we kept the staircase, and we put a great chandelier on it. But it, it works because it, it, it has a fantastic experience, but it also works from a functional point of view, because many guests will get, get off the, on the, you know, have a room on the second floor or third floor, actually choose to parade and walk down that staircase, which is quite good in, in terms of the lift capacities in the early morning when you've got the breakfast rush. So there's something that maybe we should think about again. Mm. Good thought. You, you should call our head designer. We're doing a hotel in, in, in Germany, 
and we got, it's a conversion, it's an office building, and there's a big staircase in the middle, and they're all complaining, what are we going to do with the staircase? So I'm going to say, talk to Dexter, <laughs> so take care of the staircase. But there there's, we go. there's also many yeah. experiences for me, the, the greatest place to, 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 to stay in London at the moment is in the Shard. I mean, we were part of the execution of that hotel, we didn't actually design it, but what it's about is the view across London. There is nowhere with a view like that. And, you know, forgetting what's in the room, it's just the window. Um, you know, so there are many things that, that, that impress and, 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 and are, are significant. Thank you for the question. Any other questions, folks? Yes, please. Uh, thank you. It's uh, Paul Sherwood from John Brown and Partners. We're property and construction consultants. Um, you asked a good question earlier, and I think it was answered quite well as well, although we didn't pause to recognize it had been answered. Um, we said about the um, re renovation, recycling, and doing that more frequently to meet the millennials' um, more requirements and those changes. And I think that's definitely happening now, as mm. the products perhaps aren't so long-lasting that going into rooms knowing that they're going to be recycled in, in five years' time, maybe. Right. Um, but what you went on to talk about was the size of rooms. And so if it's a 22-meter room, then obviously your renovation costs are going to come down if compared to a 28-meter room. So I guess I'd just congratulate you and say, well done, you've kind of solved the problem, asked the question and mm -hmm. solved it for us. So, so well, there can't, I'll, any, there can't any, be any more excuses not to do if, the FF&E projects more frequently. And I'm with Dext on every six months works well for us. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, we're working with Ben on something else where, I mean, we've had the opportunity of, of actually trying to harvest more rooms in space and finding space, which then helps to justify the cost that's going about it. And I think we've, we've gained about 10%. Uh, that's our usual norm. Yeah. <laughs> And, and uh, you know, that, that helps the, uh, the uh, justification for the, the spend. Thank you. Any other questions, folks, at all? Just a few final thoughts, then, in terms of good design and use of space. What would your top tips be, I guess, perhaps, Jacob, in terms of uh, maximizing use of space and return for that use of space from a design perspective. If we are going to have to reutilize space more frequently and recycle space more frequently, the budgets are not going to get any bigger, but we're going to have to stretch that dollar much further. Well, what, we do, what we do is, is we always try to find more rooms uh, in the hotel. If we can convert, if the conference room is not working, um, we try to look at, okay, can we add more rooms? Because um, this is, is our, our yeah, bread and butter. So your default position is really is about the rooms because that drives the EBITDA by and large? Yes. And, yeah. and, um, uh, but then what we did with space in, in um, uh, the hostel is, is to try to, I'll, I'll came across this uh, term that uh, um, a company in London uses, it's called LSN Global. They, they, they talk about <coughs> convergence economy. Whereas they, as we have spoken about today, they, they take hospitality, they take retail, they take food and beverage, they take everything, and they blend everything. And, and that is, um, is proven uh, in our hostel to be a very successful uh, recipe for this interaction uh, between uh, guests, between staff and guests, between different type of, of, of uh, space usage. Okay. Um, and added value to that uh, concept. So Pretty I think good. out of the box, a hotel lobby may not be used um, efficiently yep. uh, with having this um, almost like a, a lounge feeling. We can use this space and we can make money on it. Okay. Matt, any final thoughts from your perspective? Well, I think the same question, my answer would be really a bit different because we're in the business of selling the brand experience and it's all about emotions and feelings. and. So you, you have to be true to your brand and what it stands for. Uh, it, it's clearly our, we're all in business to make money. I, you know, I'm, not suggesting to, or I'm not suggesting that we forget about that. But for example, our new contemporary lifestyle brand venue. Um, we are saying primary part of the experience takes place in public areas. So obviously, we're going to spend most of our money in that space to be able to articulate the brands, what, the, what it stands for. Guest room is secondary. Right? In there, we're going to give you a comfortable bed, powerful shower, and a technology that works. Understated, simple, residential look and feel. So we're, we'll put our money 
where we're saying we're going to actually deliver against this brand promise because otherwise we're going to be, be, become a commodity, just like any other hotel. Unless I touch the feelings, and the only way to touch those feelings is through design, and interaction with the talent, and the overall experience that we provide against that brand promise. And the millennials are telling us those, those things are usually fashion, design, music, and food and beverage. So if you get those things right and articulate it right, then you can actually charge more, so you wouldn't have to worry about the cost of the, the renovation or cost of the per key and all the other things that we worry about. So that would be my final thought. Okay, very good, thank you. And Dexter, really a, a question to you. Uh, understanding that design comes at a cost, um, but for anybody out there who's contemplating hiring an architect, really, to look at space within the hotels, what would be, what would be your top tips to some hotel owners out there when they look for an architect? What do we need from oh, today's architects? No, um, <laughs> I, th I think um, making good use of space. And, and also, you know, we've learned in lobbies and, you know, we've learned that you can actually make revenue uh, in, in those lobbies and, and maximizing that. But I always say that the, the, what people often forget is what is the essence of what makes a hotel. The essence of a hotel is a good night's sleep, okay? And forgetting the frills, if you stay in a hotel where you don't get a good night's sleep because you can't control a couple of things, one, acoustics, and acoustics is relevant between you, the corridor and yourself, it's relevant between the, the rooms on either side, and it's relevant to how good that window is in regard to the noise that makes a city. If, if that's not right, and if you don't have a decent bed and a good shower or bath or whatever it is, for me, I refer to all the interior spend as lipstick on a dead fish. Because <laughs> if, and that's part of architecture, delivering that as much as the glorious look, because a dead fish with lipstick's not much good to anybody. <laughs> sure. There we go. You heard it here first, folks. Um, any final questions from the floor at all, ladies and gentlemen? Okay, well, just for me to say um, thank you very much to Jacob, to Matt, and to Dexter. I hope you found uh, the session interesting. We've covered quite a broad uh, number of issues and topics associated with hotel renovations and recycling. Thanks very much for coming, and uh, uh, good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.